Guys are wrestling fans of the world. Welcome to the Flying Guys Gene Bombcast. For each and every week, we bring you the finest analysis in New Japan professional wrestling, at least the finest on this side of the Pacific. Coming to you from the scorching shores of Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I am your host, Zachary Randall, and with me, my co-host, the white meat baby feast from Erie, Pennsylvania, Mad Matt Thompson. Maddie, tell me how you doing on this Sunday afternoon. Well, if I may borrow a uh, turn of phrase from the, the rock, the metal band Texas Hippie Coalition, I would have to tell you that I am pissed off and mad about it. What's... uh? What's bugging you on this afternoon, young man? The uh, fucking Washington team, that I won't even say the name of the mascot because they're racist, uh, beat up on my Green Bay Packers pretty bad. Uh, not to mention, you know, the officials fucked us. And, uh, yeah, I think that's more curse words than I usually say per episode already. So, <laughs> well, well, don't worry. I'll, I'm still getting my quota in, too. Um, right. Wow. So, I'm first of all, I'm, I'm sorry that happened. I'm, I'm going to guess that... Uh, he of the Thor-like golden locks probably got flagged for a roughing the passer penalty again. And, dude, even my shit fucking team beat Washington last week. So um, that that definitely stings. I, I feel you, bro. Yeah, third week in a row that uh, one Clay Matthews accrued uh, roughing the passer call just for sacking the quarterback like you would if you were a defensive player. I like feel... it's, it's such it's such a bullshit rule. Like it, it's it's whatever. I feel like uh, Clay Matthews should, should take a shot at professional wrestling at some point. He'd be great at it. If D'Angelo Williams can do it, then Clay Matthews would probably be awesome at it. Uh, D'Angelo was, was, was pretty good in his brief appearance. Something else I saw um, briefly once is um, the younger Laurinaitis, the son, of, uh, the son of Animal, and I can't remember his name. Now, do you remember his name? Was that Joe? Was it Joe Laurinaitis? Um, I think so. Okay. He actually did a photo session with his dad once where, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the younger Laurinaitis was in a uh, road warrior get up with like with the makeup and the shoulder pads. And then his dad was dressed up as a uh, football player. That's, that's fun. That's a fun little concept. I like that. So I thought that was, uh, I thought that was pretty cool. But yeah, I could see, uh, you can see Clay Matthews uh, out there doing some doing some wrestling. So, uh, how you been in the past week since we last talked? How's life treating you? Pretty well. Um, you know, just uh, working and doing the dad thing, and um, you know, had a good weekend hanging out with the fiance. We we work opposite work schedules. She works seconds, so I work first. So. Weekends are really about the only time we actually get to hang out with each other for more than like an hour at a time. So, but it was pretty nice. Yesterday was pretty cool. Um, you know, I just hung out at home, ate pizza, and just chilled out. So it was fun. Are you doing the dad thing like it's never been done before? <laughs> I'm sure somebody out there has, has done it in a comparable manner, but, uh, you know, I, and then again, I don't want to overmodulate the mic or anything, but I am doing the thing. Yeah. You just made my day, dude. Thank you. Let's try. So, all right. So, uh, actually, before I go on to my stuff, um, I might have mentioned this last week, but I'm probably going to say this on the show every week. Man, your daughter is so damn cute. And, again, she looks exactly like you at that age. It's it's scary, dude. She's like an optical illusion, though, because... You know, anybody who's seen my fiance's baby pictures think that she looks exactly like her mom. So fair enough. Yeah, yeah, it's totally uh, it, it totally depends on the day, the angle, the facial expression. She's now uh, the one thing is, is for sure, though, is that she is adorable as hell. Uh, yeah, dude. Well, she's at least, you know, from my uh, my biased family perspective, she has uh, your eyes and your smile because I just I just feel like I could go I could go find a couple baby pictures of you and it's just yeah, it's that same shit eating grin. Yeah, yeah. My uh, my grandmother on my mom's side used to refer to it as the uh, Mickey Mouse smile. There you go. That's like a the very full faced wide grin. Yeah, she she definitely has inherited that. So over here in in, uh, in my world, well, did I talk about the uh, the harrowing medical experience with my cat last week? 
Yes. Yes, okay. did. Well, she is recovered. She is actually up and scampering all around on my desk right now. She is uh, largely healed. Now that Good. she has the... Uh, the the cone of shame off she's able to properly bathe herself and her brother's actually being nice to her again um because apparently because she fucking stank and that meant that her the other cats didn't recognize her but she's uh she's getting back to normal so that's good i am still two thousand dollars poor because of that though she hasn't uh come up with a plan to uh repay me or anything um also gonna be bringing in them bringing in them birds and mice or no uh, I don't even. I might get like a dead baby frog or a dead lizard. <laughs> so that's whatever manages to run in the house. Yeah, you can always fry up them frog legs, though, dude. Oh, uh, but no, but dude, we're talking like we're talking like baby frogs that are about the size of my 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 pinky fingernail. <laughs> nice. Because they'll just I'll open the door and they'll just come hopping in and I'll be like, no baby frog, and I'll try to like shoo them back out and then they're like <laughs> gone off by the TV and it's like, oh yeah, I'll be sweeping that up a week later. Yeah. Yeah, by the time you can even ch- attempt to save it, it, it's it's done. It's fate is sealed. It, yeah, indeed. And let's see. Uh, last night had a little bit of a late night. My uh, so my girlfriend has is a, a YouTuber. She has a uh, channel focused on um, vegan vegan cooking and vegan meal prep. Um, so obviously I've got like this background in uh, podcasting and broadcasting and I've done like audio and video production, you know, on and off most of my adult life. So I've been offering to help her. So last week was the first time that I helped her help her uh, put together a couple episodes um, trying to like, you know, like bring some higher quality gear to her and, you know, just kind of given some like production techniques. But it ended up being one of those things where we recorded everything at her house and then we drove down to my place, which is like an hour away. And, you know, I set up iMovie on my Mac and imported all the video. And it just ended up being like this, like, really long, tedious and and tortuous process. And the end result was great, but I just sort of found myself sitting there in my my studio with her. And I'm just kind of, like, trying to, like, throw in a little advice every once in a while. Just feeling the whole time like I'm mansplaining and just, like, annoying the shit out of her and just sort of, like wow, she's never going to do this again. It's one of those things is, like, her and I are both these, like, super loners and... Um, always, there's never a circumstance where either one of us doesn't bristle at being, at being told what to do, even if it's like, there's, there's nothing bad behind it. So it's sort of, it's interesting when you put like two highly creative loners together in a room like that, and you also happen to be in love with each other. It's, it, it can be a little bit of a tricky thing, but, um, thankfully it turned out good and, and she was really happy with the, uh, the end result. Um, but anyway, I'm gonna. I'm actually doing this to plug her real quick. Her her YouTube channel is Natural Vegan Mama, and the video that we made yesterday is actually about vegan soul food. Maddie, I had vegan barbecue ribs yesterday, and they rocked my fucking world. No shit. I'll have to check that out then. Did, did, I, did she give a full recipe? I'm assuming. Um. So she is actually not giving the full recipe. She's she's you got she's got to get to a hundred likes on the YouTube video before she's going to give the recipe out. I might be able to pull some strings and get the recipe for you though. Okay. Yeah. Because that sounds uh, it sounds intriguing. Oh, dude, it was killer. The texture was great. Um, she thought it was a little too flowery. Um, I didn't think so. I thought the texture was killer. Um, we were kind of b- batting around some ideas on the drive home last night about how to kind of kind of up the rib game a little bit, and maybe get a little. Uh... She thought about putting a little maple syrup in it to kind of get some of that like that barbecue sauce sweetness to it. I actually suggested molasses, which I use when I make barbecue sauce, um, or just making her own barbecue sauce from scratch. But the point is, is that uh, it was a pretty killer recipe. She had some uh, she had some mac and cheese too. Um, which was pretty killer. She actually uh, chopped up. Actually, so the whole video was actually like a day's worth of vegan soul food. Um, another one of the meals that she did was uh, she did fish and grits, and instead of fish, she actually did um, she actually did eggplant, which I believe she might have breaded in uh, panko. She, if you go watch the video, you'll actually see all the spices that she used. But you fry that stuff up, dude, and it tastes like fish, and you throw that in with some grits. I mean. Dude, we were eating Southern and eating well yesterday. It sounds damn good, dude. Any uh, any collard greens involved or anything like that? We did not do any collard greens. We did get green beans, though. And as you know, in, okay. our, 
as in our family, it, it'd be practically blasphemy if you didn't have green beans with your mac and cheese and ribs. <laughs> Damn Skippy, yeah. <laughs> so that was uh, that was my week, and I actually uh, I uh, went up to her place. Uh, we did the production. We headed back down here. Um, her uh, her son sat in my uh, game room and played uh, uh, Dragon Ball Xenoverse two all night. So he was he was good to go. And then uh, that's legit. Yeah, yeah. He's he's uh he's the kind of kid that walks around in a uh, turtle hermit hoodie all the time, which kind of tells you a lot of what you need to know. <laughs> um, if I thought I looked good in orange, I'd probably walk around in a turtle her- her- hermit hoodie all the time too. That's legit. Uh, I, I respect that game. And I drove him back home, and then so I got I got back here about uh, I don't know probably three three thirty in the morning, and then decided I needed to get in an hour of Diablo before I went to bed. And about five hours later, Orca decided it was time for me to get up. So that's uh, that has been my weekend. Word, yeah the. Uh... This morning for me, it was kind of started out the same way. I, I got up, and just because my back was stiff, I thought that maybe if I went late on the couch, I'd uh, be able to catch another hour or so. But as soon as I walked in the living room, Olivia's head's poking out over the uh, the little bumper thing in the crib. We got one of those, like, you know, little bumper pad things that goes all the way around it. And she likes to peek her little eyes up above that. <laughs> kind of looks like, uh, for those who remember the home improvement uh, sitcom, the, uh, the neighbor Wilson used to poke his head over the, the fence and talk to Tim Allen. So nice. very, very similar. Except, you know, obviously like a million times cuter, like we already mentioned, but yeah. So Olivia, so that was how my morning started. So Olivia is what, is she six months now? She'll be seven months on the 26th. Very nice. Very nice. Um, so you want to talk about some wrestling? Yes, absolutely. So if that's not what we hear. Then why bother? Uh, goddamn right. Okay. So. Here's here's the game plan for the next couple of weeks. Um, main goal today is to talk about destruction in uh, Beppu, which was the show from um, last Monday, which was headlined by Naito versus the most evil motherfucker on the planet, Minoru Suzuki. Now, already today, we've had the final destruction show, Destruction in Kobe, which is the Tana Okada match, and also the... Um, uh, Ku- my secret boyfriend Kushida and Bushi in the uh, junior heavyweight tournament. Um, we're not discussing that today. Neither one of us have watched it. We're actually going to talk about that next week. Otherwise, we wouldn't wouldn't have anything for a show next week because t- uh, next Sunday night is uh, the next Long Beach show. So we won't be covering that until two weeks from now. So we still wanted to do a show and have some content. Question for you, though, Maddie, um, before we dive into the Beppu show, do we want to talk about what happened at the end of uh, the Kobe show? I don't know if I want to spoil it for the people, but um, we can definitely point them in the direction of where to find out in a, in a rather quick manner. Yeah, I would actually say just go jump over to uh, F4WOnline.com and read the results, or you can see... Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Lariato's um, uh, Twitter, Twitter, Twitter page. He has a uh, he has a gif of it. I actually really want to talk about it now, but I'm gonna I'm gonna trust in Maddie, and we're we're actually gonna leave this one. But um, you actually saw the fruition of an angle that's been building up um, most of the year. Yeah, uh, especially heated up the last few weeks with um, with these destruction shows and, and you know coming out of the G1. So, um, you know, it's 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 awesome when you have something like this because New Japan really doesn't do a lot of angles, but when they do, they uh, you know they feel really special and really important. So, um, I, I mean, you know, I don't love every aspect of of Ghetto's booking, um, and that's and that's not like a big rip, but I just I don't love every part of it. But when he pays off something like this, I mean, he pays it off. Yeah, and this uh, most certainly does that. So um, I highly recommend, you know, if you if you're really uh, itching to find out what happens, then, you know, catch up and watch the show, at least watch the main event of the of the Kobe show. But, you know, if not, if you need to catch up on Beppu first, um, you know, do it up because this stuff is uh, this stuff is really heating up. It is. I think I think we're set set for a uh, 
I think the destruction shows were were a little were a little mild and a little underwhelming. Um, but if you like New Japan, you'll still like it. But coming out of the G one, where you have like six to twelve match of the year candidates, um, you know it, it's it's stuff. I actually, on a side note, by the way, um, I, I barely watch any. WWE now even in NXT I'll watch the the takeovers. Apparently uh Ricochet and uh who is it Pete Dunne. Is it Pete Dunne or is it Trent? Yeah. yeah. Pete Dunne had the ridiculous match apparently on Wednesday night. Yeah, I will have to go back and watch that as well. Um I kind of feel guilty for not watching the May Young tournament at least, but um you know, maybe if uh you know, if I feel so compelled I'll catch up on that eventually. I hear mixed results about it. Um Lance Storm is back on the Observer now, and he's doing a weekly show with uh, Brian Alvarez. <clears throat> and Lance might be my favorite guy to my favorite guy f- from like a former wrestler to hear talk about wrestling because he's so smart and so direct. And I really like hearing how he breaks this. And I think I was talking about it last week when he was talking about he was talking about training Rachel uh, Ellering. Um, yeah, you did. Yeah. So really, what what I hear when I when I hear stuff about the the May Young is that it's like it's like feast or famine. Yeah, I mean, there's probably you know fewer really talented um, women who aren't under contract for WWE. So it's it's kind of you know at least in the early rounds it's going to be hard, but once you really get down to the you know to the final rounds, I'm sure it'll be pretty quality stuff. Yeah, women's wrestling is still gaining traction, and I and I feel like maybe you give it another five or ten years, and you'll have a near equal number of off awesome male and female wrestlers. The truth is, though, to try to to try to put together a thirty two woman tournament um, of people that aren't already um, tied up by one of the major organizations, the the talent pool isn't that deep right now. Yeah, the um. You know, the logical thing would probably be to just cut it to 16, but oh well. But it is uh, it is cool that they're putting some new names in front of faces. So, um, you know, full props to those guys for uh, for that. Absolutely. Oh, by the way, dude, can I fucking bitch about WWE? Sure. Yeah. Uh, you know what? I get the awesomeness of Brock Lesnar coming out. And by the way, Brock looking fucking thin and ripped and having a uh, a woodland axe murderer beard rocking. That's not quite that bad. Actually, Brock looks sca- skinny, bearded Brock looks scarier than roided out Brock, for the record. Um, Brock prepping for the octagon is scarier than, than, than pro wrestling Brock, let's put it that way. Anyway, but dude, to have a Hell in a Cell match and have it go to a no finish... Like, WWE has invented all these amazing gimmicks, and then they burn through all of them. Like, the Hell in a Cell is one of the best gimmicks in all of professional wrestling history, and they've, it's, they've just pissed it away time and time again. What the fuck is a point of having a Hell in a Cell match if you're always going to have interference? And I know some smartass is going to chime in and they say, well... You know, Sean climbed up the cage in the first Hell in a Cell match, and then Kane ripped the the door of the cage off. All that shit made storyline sense, and you still had a finish. Just, anyway. Guys, have finishes in your matches. Don't fuck your fans that pay for tickets and are there live. Again, I get it. It was a cool moment, but your fans in the stadium weren't happy. And having paid for ringside seats to major WWE events, that's a major fucking outlay of cash. All right, I'm done. Well, yeah, I think that, you know, the biggest underlying problem with all that is, you know, why would you even, um, you know, have the, in the first place have, a, you know, a, a pay-per-view that's just, oh, it's, it's September, let this have, let's have this be hell in a cell month. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, I just... So I think that that's, you know, the first problem there. And, you know, they, the, the feud wasn't ready for the for the match. It didn't call for that stipulation yet. And even if it did, I mean, what the fuck? <laughs> like, and then to have they, didn't they have Sorry, gold dust and road dog sitting on Twitter shit talking their fans. 
And that's, that's, you know, dude, don't sit there and fucking gaslight your own fans. And yeah, one of the, that, one of the uh, reasons. I've, I've had enough of Road Dog as far as that goes for sure. And as, as a professional wrestling fan of 36 years now, I want WWE to be good, but it's not good, generally speaking. And it's okay for me to sit here and talk about it, that it's not good and that I think other wrestling is good. It doesn't make me a mark or a smark or whatever. I can objectively sit here and say a piece of entertainment is not good. So don't gaslight your fucking fans. Because by the way, by the way, I guarantee I am in the like top 10% of people that, that spend money on like wrestling and wrestling events and merchandise and streaming services been a fucking WWE Network subscriber since day one, so it's not like I don't support the brand. Shit, I was a day one subscriber too, and you know, I just don't see the point in it anymore. You know, it's been it's been probably over a year since I uh, since I you know discontinued it. So, just, all right, it's ridiculous. I'm gonna stop my cranky old man routine now, um, at least for the moment. I can't promise I won't get back because I got a glass of red wine in front of me, but. Uh, Let's, let's get back on here. So, September 17th in Beppu, Japan. Destruction in Beppu. This is the second of three major shows in New Japan's Destruction Tour. Uh, Maddie, kick us off. Sure. So, uh, starting off, we had a tag match. We had uh, Ten Cozy, and they were teaming uh, with uh, Yoda Suji. And they were taking on Yuya Uemura. Uh, Manabu Nakanishi and Yuji Nagata. So um, let me just you know, say that I will always be happy to see Ten Cozy. Yeah, they uh, they had their you know some signature spots in the match there. Um, you know, every time you get to to see the machine gun chops and the the Mongolian chops and uh, you know uh, Kojima hit a Koji cutter on Nagata late in the match. So it was pretty cool to see them back and, and doing the uh, the old hits, if you will. And you know what? The more I think about it, if I ever get married again, I want Ten Cozy to be two of my uh, groomsmen. <laughs> That's legit. I, I can get behind that. Yeah, yeah. You'll Especially, be one. You'll be one of them too. So you'll actually be at like all like the wedding parties with fucking Kojima and Tenzan, which is, just, just has to be say, awesome. Yeah. Especially if I get to hang out with them, that would be that would be worth the while for sure. <laughs> Imagine how cool that would be, and then get like. Uh, you know, if there's, you know, if I can, can, you know, if I, if I ever actually find somebody willing to marry me again, convince, uh, convince my bride to be to have like, uh, um, like Oscar as, as one of her, as one of her bridesmaids. That'd be lit. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So anyway, um, very typical new Japan opener tag match. Um, Young dudes with the young lions. Um, dude, Nagata's still a badass. Let me just say that. Yeah, he, uh, you know, he he took that Koji cutter, and then Koji was kind of uh, he was a little bit uh, conflicted on, on what to do. He was, you know, considering just ending the match there, but instead, uh, Tsuji was able to, um, you know, convince him to uh, tag in, and Nagata just ate him alive. I feel like. And, and Nagata's obviously not a young guy. I feel like in a promotion that's not as stacked as New Japan is with, like, guys in their, like, really peak guys in their 30s, I think Nagata's still, like, an upper mid-card guy otherwise, you know? Yeah, he could easily be if he, uh, you know, if he was on a, a thinner roster, yeah. I don't see that being out of the out of the question. But uh, yeah, Nagata's team goes over because Nagata hits uh, an exploder and a Nagata lock crossface on Suji for the tap out. Yep, uh, yeah, pretty standard stuff. Um, I think um, I think it was Suji got some some good offense into you know shut off his stuff a little bit, but he ultimately he uh, he ended up taking the loss. So next, we got another tag match. We've got Rin Narita and uh, your boyfriend, David Finley, taking on Shota Umino and Toa Hinare. Dude, there's so much, like, upside in this match. Like, like you're at, this is yeah. actually like a future of New Japan match right here. Oh, yeah, totally. Um, 
yeah, you know, especially with Umino, uh, I feel like it, it seems like he's bulked up quite a bit. Am I the only one who thinks that, or what, what's your? Uh, I'd have to I'd have to look again. I mean, that. he is all the the new lions tend to be pretty slender guys, but um, yeah, I'll just have to I'll just have to pay more attention the next time I look. Yeah, I think he's I think he's put on a little bit more mass um, in recent uh, you know recent months, and uh, yeah he uh, yeah he pulled off some some good looking stuff. He and uh, Narita were both you know doing their thing. I think um, I think it was Umino locked in uh, a Boston Crab at one point. Your your standard uh, your standard young lion submission, but um, you know ultimately that uh, didn't really amount to much because uh, David Finley. Ended up hitting uh, a Uranaki backbreaker and a stunner on Umino to get the win. How do you feel about so, uh, How do you feel about Finley using the stunner? I'm cool with it. Uh, nobody else in the promotion really uses it. Um, nobody really in, in any of the major promotions uses it other than him, as far as I can remember. I mean, Kevin Owens will occasionally hit one. John Cena will occasionally hit one. At least you know, he did. Uh, you know, did his last uh, U.S. title run, but. Yeah, he did yeah that. you know, it's not... Oh, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was going to say he did that springboard stunner. Right, yeah, so it's not being, you know, it's not being overused anywhere else. So, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see any harm in it. It's, it's one of those moves that, uh, to me, still feels a little sacred, but, you know, so long as it doesn't just become some transition spot, cool. Yeah, and he doesn't, um, he doesn't typically do the kick beforehand, which I feel like... You know, just doing something as simple as a kick to the gut that uh, is like a, uh, a precursor. You know, feels like it adds a little bit more, uh, you know, um, gravitas to it or whatever. Like, you know, it, it gives you that moment to realize that you know what's coming. So if he were to maybe do a little setup like that, maybe not if it was just a knee to the gut or something like that. Just something to, uh, you know, no pun intended, but to stun the opponent prior to the move. How about, a, would make it how about better. A, a European uppercut? To stagger him back a little bit. Yeah, hell yeah, that'd be that'd be uh, a good setup too. Absolutely. Now I need to go do that in Fire Pro. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So what do we got next? Next, we've got um, probably the low point in the show. <laughs> uh, yeah. Perfectly honest. Um, Ayato Yoshida taking on Takashi Izuka. Um, I don't know what the point is in having Izuka do a singles match against a young lion. And, um, you know, he's only really been back very briefly, and I'm already kind of fucking over it. <laughs> I don't know what the point is of ever having Izuka do anything. Yeah. Um, especially, like, you know, we, we, I talked about it last week. Like, why does this savage, who ends up getting DQ'd anyway... Why does he break for a referee's four count when he's biting on Yoshida's foot or biting his forehead or choking him with a piece of rope? Why would he even bother if he's supposed to be this savage who, you know, can't be bothered to walk down the ramp when he's supposed to and needs a muzzle to keep himself from, you know, tearing people's flesh off with his teeth? I just it, it baffles me. I feel like there's maybe a conspiracy here. Maybe maybe Taka's Taka's up to something here because Taka I don't I don't trust that guy. No, absolutely not. Um, yeah, perhaps there's something something more to it. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm gonna have some people look into this. Yeah. So um, now nothing really to uh, talk about that I haven't already mentioned in my little rant there, uh, except for he pulls out uh, his little spike glove thing. Does does uh, Izuka? which looks fake as fuck, doesn't even really look like a steel glove, just looks like some bedazzled bullshit. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> jabs into Yoshida's throat, and the ref calls for the DQ. Way to go. Whoopee. I, I think if we ever... I think maybe we should form a band one day called Bedazzled Bullshit. There's a good... Um, there's a good song off the Hunter album by Mastodon called Bedazzled Fingernails. That, yeah, that, yeah. It's a good you know, track. I, that's actually a really good album, and that's the album that made like all, like all these fucking dipshit like hipsters. I know hate Mastodon because they wrote a rock and roll album. Yeah, I thought it was good. I mean, I, I don't understand why, you know, just because the songs are shorter and 
you know, I think they had Brendan O'Brien do the production on that one. He had a little bit more like a, like almost a classic rock feel to it, but I don't see anything wrong with it. I thought it was pretty dope. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's God forbid you write, uh, you sing clean and write catchy songs and you know, yeah. God, yeah. You know, for fuck's sake, you know, you wouldn't want to make the kind of music you want to make or anything. Right. Yeah. How dare you, uh, you know, evolve as an artist for shame. I know. I know. Speaking of, uh, Speaking of amazing heavy metal bands, um, my uh, the the release of my band Northern Crown's next record is rapidly approaching, October the twelfth. Very nice. Um, that's my mother's birthday weekend, so it'll be easy to remember. Also, uh, we actually dropped a couple uh, tracks this week. If uh, Sonic Perspectives has uh, has one track streaming exclusively and then if you head over to our band camp we've actually got another uh it's our uh it's our rock and roll track on the album and uh if you pre-order the album you actually get to download it because we're like awesome and love our fans that way all right i'm I'm done plugging for the moment good deal so um the following match up here this was a fun little uh kind of a inconsequential match but still uh you know, goofy and, and fun nonetheless. And we have uh, Ryusuke Taguchi teaming up with uh, your boyfriend, which I didn't know previously, uh, Kushida. Secret, secret boyfriend, secret boyfriend. Secret, gotcha. Um, as well as Tiger Mask and Jush and Thunder Liger. So uh, eight-man tag taking on Sho, Yo, Rocky Romero, and Will Ospreay. Rapungi 3K plus one. And, um, you know, Taguchi comes out with his... Uh, his scrum hat. I called it a, a rugby helmet last week, and I, I didn't know the uh, technical jargon. Sorry. And indeed, it is, uh, is known as a scrum hat. I should have known that. I had lots of friends who were uh, on the rugby team in, in uh, college, and, and I let them isn't, down. Isn't college rugby, like, the, the fact that that's a thing, such, like, a weird notion? And especially because we – I mean, I eventually ended up at a bigger school, but, like, at smaller schools, that's totally a thing. It is totally a thing, and they tried to recruit me several times, <laughs> and I just I did not want to have to like, you know, show up for a, a test or God forbid student teaching with like you know a busted lip and, you know, like I didn't know what like the the, the um the health insurance coverage was then in those days, and I just I didn't want to uh, to risk it. Yeah, but a lot of those guys, a lot of those guys though. ended up. Oh, totally. Yeah, I mean, I I, I would have worked out well in there, but. Uh, you know, like I, I didn't want to develop a pill habit or anything either. I knew that, you know, those guys were popping some pretty serious painkillers afterwards, too. So that reminds this didn't me, seem like speaking a fun of pills, gig. speaking of pills, I got sent home with this little uh, pharmacopoeia for my kitty and uh, they sent home some painkillers for her. And now I've got the I got fucking Judas Priest playing in my head. What are you going to do? It's a life of a metalhead. Um and I actually got looking up what it was that they sent her, and it was actually a, uh, an opioid. And, man, she spent a good, like, three or four days stoned out of her little kitty mind. That's pretty hilarious. Like, I, I mean, I don't know, you know, PETA might be coming for you after that one, but, uh, yeah, that's pretty funny nonetheless. Well, you know what? If, if PETA's upset that I, I, I dropped two grand on saving my cat's life and that I gave her some painkillers so she could get through, uh, you know, being get through being filled with uh um pus for a few days i i come at me bro yeah yeah that, that's uh it's it's a stretch but you never know listen Peta got mad about uh mario wearing the tanuki suit so <laughs> oh what the hell what are you gonna do yeah yeah what are you going to do? So we got uh, we got our fun little junior match here. Um, scrum hat, please continue, Matt. Yeah. Um, so we uh, we do the little base coach spot with uh, with Ryusuke Taguchi. And, you know, he's uh, he's really hamming it up doing his thing. And then, um, you know, he, he props himself up on the, the second rope with his with his uh, posterior uh, facing towards the center of the ring. And uh the, the teammates whip uh, Irish whip Yo into Taguchi's ass. And instead of, you know, bumping into it like most opponents do, Yo just like straight up plunges his, his hand in, uh, into Gucci's hole. So question for you. 
two questions. Do you think Yo has any experience as a proctologist? <laughs> I don't really know that much about Yo's background. And secondly, what's what's better is that the Taguchi ass spots or the Joey Ryan dick spots? Um, it's a good question. I feel like, um, you know, Joey Ryan is like a main eventing shows with the dick spots. So if you're judging it purely on, you know, the success of it, I would say that. But it, is um, Joey main eventing? He main events like you know indie shows. He goes around and. I mean, yeah, okay, I I'm not, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just saying when I've seen him on indie shows, he's a big attraction, but he's definitely not the main event. Okay, well, he he posted on Twitter um, today or yesterday that you know there was a, a flyer outside of a show that said you know this this act, Joy Ryan's act, it you know includes some crude humor. Uh, if you want to you know take your kids and leave, you know his his match will be last. Okay, and, all right. And he put in parentheses like, yeah, you know, let's change that to main eventer. So, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a good way to make light of it. But yeah, you know, it, it's 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 the gist of his act. And Taguchi, I would argue, brings more to the table, though. So it's, uh, you know, it's really all a matter of what your preference is. And on a, on a side note, I've mentioned this before, and I will I will continue to do so. Joey gets so much out of so little. And I've seen him do indie shows where he really just does like, like maybe like four or five spots and they're all related to like the dick and the, and the lollipop and the, and the, like the massage oil. Um, and dude, you know what he makes, he makes it work. And I know that, uh, a lot of people don't like it, but I, he, I don't know, dude, he's being pretty fucking smart with it. Yeah, I mean, more power to him. I don't, uh, I don't, you know, whatever. I don't uh, disagree with it. I, you know, I, I have no no beef with it. So, yeah. You're not gonna get all Jim Cornette about it. No, there's no need to get Jim Cornette about much anything, except for Yuzuka. Yeah, or the finish of that Hell in a Cell. Yeah, or well, I, I won't even get into AJ Styles, but I, I, I heard that that finish was bullshit too. Uh, okay, so anyway, who t- tell us tell us about the tell us about this uh, ta- this awesome junior heavyweight tag match? Yeah, so um, after we have the, uh, the the proctologist spot, as it were, as you uh, refer to it, um, Rocky Romero uh, mocks the base coach spot with his uh, chaos guys, and he kind of goes overboard with it. Uh, starts doing the forever close lines, and all his teammates are just kind of standing around like, dude, like calm down. So that was pretty fun, too. Um, and then after that, we have um, a nice little preview of a potential, and I would argue the most likely, um, junior heavyweight tournament final between uh, Osprey and Kushida. Some nice back and forth. Osprey hit his uh, Pip Pip Cheerio springboard uh, forearm, and uh, Kushida did some nice, uh, you know, his handsprings and his cartwheel drop kicks and at one point he was firing up throwing hip tosses on everybody and almost hip tossed the referee so that was pretty fun too that's awesome um yeah, so that was that was fun how long until we're gonna see uh will osprey as a uh, heavyweight main eventer man and i hope not long i i hope it's sooner rather than later but you know again it's it's just a, a matter of new japan's um roster being so stacked yeah i guess i i mean I mean, this is a thing to talk about more later. I think, I think, for example, Tan is getting his his last run, um, and he can kind of go into whatever elder statesman role. You know, Naito is always going to be at the top, but I'm I've I'm kind of at the point where Naito just isn't going to be the the world champ guy. Naito is sort of your uh, your Roddy Piper, right? He's the guy that actually doesn't need the belt. Totally, yeah. So, um, you know, you still got Kenny up there. You know, I think I think there's there's space for there's absolutely space for Osprey to move in there. Um, and then, I mean, I, I I think as we we as we lead up to um, Wrestle Kingdom, we're gonna have a lot to talk about and what that main event picture 
is uh, is looking like in New Japan. Yeah, that ought to be uh, that ought to be interesting. You know, that they're they're so good at replenishing their roster once um, once guys sort of hit the twilight of their careers and, and move on, or you know whether they get uh, eaten up by WWE or, or whomever. Well, yeah, dude. Uh, I mean, just look at uh, you know, just look at uh, when you had AJ Shinsuke and um, the Good Brothers all go to WWE at the same time, and <clears throat> like they didn't skip a beat. And the thing is, Shinsuke is all, a New Japan all-time great, right? And you know the guy that you know the one of the founders of Chaos and big rival of uh, Tanahashi. Um, I would say Carl Anderson, a more important New Japan guy than um, Luke Gallows was, because Carl Anderson was actually pretty high up on the card. Um, Carl Anderson was like the heart and soul of the Bullet Club, too. Yeah. Like he, like especially when AJ um, was there and took over for Devitt, like, you know, Carl Anderson was like cutting all the promos. He was their entire personality. How is how is so. WWE missing? I wasn't going to bitch about WWE again. How is WWE missing the ball on <laughs> Carl Anderson? I don't know. He's like, and the thing about him is like, you know, the main gripe that they would have had would have been like his body wasn't perfect. And now he's fucking shredded. Yeah. Like he, that's like, that was the one knock that you could have had on him. And now he's, you know, he's, he's remedied that. And yeah, it just, it, it, uh, it blows my mind. I don't get it. So, uh, anyway, so, uh, the, the team Taguchi goes over, uh, in this match. And interestingly enough, um, uh, Tiger Mask gets the pin on, on Rocky. Not shocking that Rocky, uh, takes the pin again. Rocky is fully in the, uh, Ghetto and Jado phase of his career now. Um, actually, I, I think I know why they might have done that, um, because of something that happened on the, uh, Kobe show today, but that's still, that's interesting that, that Tiger Mask got the pin. Yeah, um, with a tombstone, nonetheless. That's the interesting part. Because he hit the Tiger Driver, and Romero kicked out of that, so he, he went for the tombstone and got the win. Um, I don't. Did you catch the um, post-match interviews at all? Yeah, I generally don't watch those. Okay. This one was funny as hell. Like, if you don't generally watch those, I would recommend just going on there on New Japan's YouTube uh, page and looking up specifically this one because like they come back and Osprey is like you know what the hell guys like we were doing rugby like we could have won the the New Japan World Rugby Cup and like everybody's just looking at him like what and Rocky's like I thought we were doing baseball because <laughs> he did the base coach spot and and then um, Rocky's just like me at, like rambling afterwards like talking about how like you know like well, how the hell did Tiger Mask beat me two times in a row like what the hell and then he goes on about how um you know, how they all look like Greek gods. It's like, look at this body. Look at this body. Just like pointing at Sho and Yo. And they just keep staring at him going like, yes. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I Even though they it. have no idea what the hell is going on. And then afterwards, like they ask each other, like, did you know? Did you understand any of that? And they're like, yeah, no. I, I love it. <laughs> it was during the G1 when Rocky was calling it with uh, Kevin Kelly. Rocky kept referring to himself as a body guy. Yeah, he did, he did the same thing here, too. It was, it was pretty funny. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that makes me happy. Yeah. The little, the little mocha hoot, if I may, uh, steal the, the term from their, uh, their, uh, tiz shiz days. <laughs> All right. So, uh, up next we have, uh, have a match that I think is, uh, setting up, uh, setting up some, for some stuff later in the year. We have the best friends, Chucky T and Beretta taking on. Killer Elite Squad, Davy Boy Smith Jr., and fuck that guy Lance Archer. <laughs> fuck him a lot less now that he's not spitting water in everybody's face. But well, um, I, hope, I hope somebody had a conversation with him and that they even as a heel they were able to convince him. It's like, you know what? That's a little rude and, and unhygienic. Yeah, it, it, it's cheap heat, too. It, you know, as, as, far as, as far as that's concerned. Like, yeah, you're going to piss people off, but it's not for the right reasons. So what's what's cheaper heat, the spitting water on the crowd or shit talking the lo local city and sports teams? I got to go with water because that, that's going to piss you off more 
and it's like you know less and it, it, it carries over less through time you know maybe if if you uh if you remember like elias or whoever who you know he's like the main guy who does that now so that's why i'm using him as the example you know if you come over and you know six months later after the last tour and, and you see him again, you go, man, that motherfucker, like he was talking mad shit <laughs> last time we were here. And he, maybe he's even turned baby face. Now you'll still remember it. I feel like, you know, you won't even remember Lance Archer doing that unless you were like one of the few people in the front crowd who directly got spit on. Yeah. Like maybe you just had like, like eye surgery or something and he spits water on it. And then you get like some weird wrestler infection, you know, and that, like that's, <laughs> You know, actually, at my last after after my last live wrestling show, I had just had eye surgery and I didn't have a patch on because the doctor said I didn't need to, and I actually ended up with I ended up with water in my eye. Ugh. Yeah. Look, you ended up with MRSA or something. Jesus. Um, well, it was three weeks ago, and the eye is still intact. So. That's good. So so anyway, so Maddie, tell us about this uh, heavyweight tag team extravaganza. Yeah, so um, I feel like this match was one of the high points on the card, honestly. Um, and, and in reference to what we were just talking about, Kevin Kelly mentioned on commentary that um, you know that, that it seems like it's a more serious turn for KES, like they're coming out with a vengeance. And part of that is, you know, Archer not doing the the water business. Like you know, he's he's done playing around. He's going to come right to the ring and you know get down to wrecking dudes. And uh, that's exactly what they did here. So uh, get on to get on a tangent for a second. Um, obviously, the I mean, a lot of the titles have been have felt really um, secondary for the past few months because um, the tag titles haven't been defended. I mean, but the Bucks aren't always around. I don't think the tag titles have been defended since uh, G One in San Francisco, which was fuck almost three months ago now. Um, Junior tag titles haven't been defended in uh, forever. Um, the IC title's been in, incognito, and they ba- they basically don't defend the uh, U.S. title. We'll, we'll actually see that defended next week. And uh, the junior heavyweight title's been off the shelf because um, Dragon Lee tried to kill Hiromu. So, yeah, it's uh, it's really been uh, a very dormant secondary title situation. Yeah. So I I have never felt that the uh, I, uh, the New Japan uh, heavyweight tag title scene was that strong. Um, you'll have your moments. Like it was cool when War Machine was there, and um, you know, uh, God has their moments. Although those guys, uh, fucking Tama has just started to annoy the shit out of me at this point. Um, you know, obviously War Machine's gone. Um, Killer Late Squad is good, but I, I don't see the need for the junior tag titles, um, and especially when you see the Bucks moving up. Um, because, I mean, I don't know, wouldn't it be cool to see, like, Yo and Sho working with these guys, too? Yeah, I think they could pull it off. Um, yeah, they're, they're kind of in a, a weird in-between phase, as far as that goes, because, you know, if they were to do singles matches, they'd be juniors but they'd be in the mix as as uh as heavies as far as the the tag division is concerned so it's kind of a a messy little spot but we know what it is and and this is part of this is me growing up as a wwf and i just remember like like a team like the rockers out there wrestling like the big guys or whatever and they could still go out there and pull it off or you know it's back when you know uh brent wasn't that big um, and they'd still take on bigger guys or whatever. So I don't know. That's that's part of just my like my wrestling upbringing. I like the junior heavyweight uh, singles title. I just I, I guess I just feel differently about the the uh, having a tag time a tag title for the weight class. I can I can understand that they they've got their um, junior tag league coming up. So maybe uh, maybe that'll sway you one way or the other. Well, and we'll see. Because um, the thing is, is that with the Bucks gone, and then, um, you know, obviously Romero and Beretta split last year, and Ricochet's gone, so you don't have you don't have Funky Future anymore. I, I 
I don't know, man. Something needs to happen. The, the way, I don't know if they can. They they got some people they're bringing in, but the 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 junior heavyweight division in New Japan used to feel really deep, and it, it feels the exact opposite right now to me. And maybe that's just because they haven't been focusing on it. But I mean, you've got. I mean, Yo and Show will get get involved in a singles way. I think pretty soon, but. I think right now that the, like the the junior heavyweight singles picture is Kushida, Osprey, and and Skrull. Yeah, it doesn't help that your uh, your ace is is on the shelf for a long time. That that does detract some, um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, Ricochet, Ricochet being gone detracts, um, and then you know some of the Mexican guys haven't been over lately either, like the. Uh, uh, Volador, and then I don't know. I don't. I on, I don't know what this means for Dragon Lee in the future. Oh, by the way, I'm, another tangent here. I'm gonna tangent from the tangent. So I watched some lucha recently, because um, the CML CMLL anniversary show was recently. Um, dude, I don't understand lucha. It's uh, yeah, it's pretty frenetic stuff. It's different. And on top of that, so this CMLL show, which is you can go watch on uh, Honor Club, they didn't have any on-screen graphics. So except for the guys that I explicitly knew, I didn't know who any of the wrestlers were. Well, that most certainly doesn't help either. So that was um, that, that was a little difficult. They, I, I, and unless I missed it or whatever, they didn't because a lot of these these multi-man tag matches are like two out of three fall matches, right? Oh, okay. There, there's no bell ringing at the end of a fall. So then everybody just sort of like stops and and I'm like, okay, so is that the end of the fall? What's at the end of the match? I don't I don't know what's going on here. And maybe I'd I'd start to pick it up after if I kept watching it, but as like my first like authentic lucha viewing experience, I was like Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like that would make it even more difficult to follow than it already would be. Um, I did see a cool spot, though, where uh, uh, Pentagon Jr. Uh, uh, Ronald um, Ray Phoenix onto uh, the opponents outside of the ring. That does sound uh, pretty dope. Another thing I just was thinking about, too, as far as the juniors is concerned, um, what, uh, you know, what, what would Matt Seidel be doing right now if he you know, wasn't fond of synthetic cannabis. Yeah, I mean, he would, yeah. I mean, fair enough. He would be a top guy. I mean, here's the thing. Um, we're getting into an era in the U.S. where things are getting to be, like, way more chill about weed. Um, I mean, it's like it's it's legal medicinally here, and it's it's not uncommon to if you don't actually openly see it in the public here in Florida, you at least like pretty clearly smell that somebody nearby is smoking it and it just sort of is what it is. But uh, Japan is not the United States, and Japan still has a um, serious issue with that stuff to the point that it stopped um, uh, Matt Riddle from working over there because he was, he's an open proponent of marijuana. And New Japan sent him an offer sheet right around the same time that NXT did for, for those who may not know. Um, I have a funny personal story. Do it. Um, so my, uh, parents went to visit, um, your family, our family, uh, in Indiana. And there was a family function and, um, my parents like specifically for this event, I think purchased, um, a a uh, vape pen. Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. So they were able to, uh, you know, get through the function without uh, crippling social anxiety. <laughs> I understand. I've got... Uh, and, I, and as well as, you know, being discreet and not uh, drawing undue attention to themselves. I've got a, I've got a vape that you can, that you can stash in your pocket, but it's not a pen. It's a little, it's a little bigger than that. So I... I guess I could duck behind a tree and, and hit hit the button and heat it up and take a hit off of it, but it's not like 
Like I've, I've got some friends that have like vape pens that you can load up with liquid that you could totally just like take a drag off of and stash. And just so long as you blew the smoke somewhere else, nobody would know. Yeah. Well, that's what, the, that's what theirs is. I think it was just like a, you know, the oil cartridge. So like, you know, no smell, no nothing like pretty, uh, pretty well as discreet as you can be. Well, you know what? That's uh, you know, I'm glad your folks are practical because that's basically what you got to do to get one, through one of those gatherings. Yeah. Um, I, I can't say I blame them one bit. There's actually a, Oh, never mind. I'm not going to tell that story on the air. Let's talk about this tag team match. Sure. Yeah. Um, some pretty uh, six spots here. Most of them, uh, you know, aren't coming from KES as far as uh, you know them being on offense. Um, I like the the spot that they did where they do the um, the, the flapjack into the uh, big power slam, uh-huh. which they did to Beretta. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, you know, looks like they're going to set up for like a you know your standard uh, 3D. Which you know pretty much every tag team does, but then they they put a little twist on it and make it a little bit more of a power move, which you know fits their style a lot better. Um, there was uh, another brutal spot where um, Beretta goes for a tope suicida and Archer catches them and choke slams them onto the apron, and that just looked really rough. And uh, Beretta sold it really well too, like his back was just wrecked. So, um. This is a, this is going to be a pretty big feud going forward the rest of this year, I think. Um, it's so interesting to me to see uh, Chuck E. T.'s continued uh, presence in New Japan, and he's obviously is a is a you know huge indie star in the U.S. Um, like he's he's etching out a spot from here for himself in in New Japan, and it's not a thing I would have expected. Yeah, he. Uh... He's totally like a, a PWG guy, you know, like really not uh, not the type of guy you would suspect to, to have a big push over in Japan. But, you know, yet again, you could probably have said the same thing about the Young Bucks, you know, and, and see uh, you know, how they've, they've uh, evolved and succeeded in, in New Japan. So it's, uh, yeah, it's something a little different. It's fair enough. Um, uh, tell us about the finish on this. Sure, yeah, so, um, you know, Beretta's getting his ass beat, and uh, he goes to tag in Chucky T, and then uh, as he's going to do so, Davey pulls Chucky off the apron and suplexes him on the floor, so that pretty well uh, takes him out of the picture, and then uh, KES had a killer bomb on Beretta to pick up the win. And then afterwards, uh, Lance Lance Archer gets uh, Narita way up in the air on a, a huge choke slam. And, uh, yeah, again, you know, a little bit of cheap heat, but not quite as cheap as a water bottle spot. <laughs> and, uh, these, these two teams, uh, met again today at the Kobe show, but, uh, you know, you guys know where to go find results. Otherwise we'll talk about that next week. Totally. So up next, um, we have a, uh, LIJ versus uh, Suzuki goon match. We have, uh, Bushi Sonata and evil taking on, El Desperado, uh, Kanemaru, and Zack Sabre Jr. Yeah, a uh, fun little match. Starts off with a paradise lock, which is always good fun. Um, this time it's Car- Kanemaru on the receiving end. Uh, you know, gets a nice drop kick in the ass for his, uh, for his trouble. And, um, you yeah, know, lots of fast-paced action with the, uh, the junior heavyweight guys um, on both sides. Um, you know, Bushi hits a nice missile drop kick. Uh, you know, one leg to each guy as far as, uh, you know, Kanemaru and Desperado. There's a little Bushi Rooney afterwards. Some pretty fun stuff. Um, and then as the we got down the stretch of the match, we get uh, Evil and Zack Sabre Jr. Looks like they're setting up for a feud between these two here. Um, Evil hits a Fisherman Buster. And then um, Zack Sabre Jr. starts working the arm, gets the octopus lock, locked on. And um, Evil ends up having to bite the, the top rope to... To get the rope break. So was that uh, uh, who, uh, against who did Ishii do that? You remember that when Ishii? It's mm, a, a good question. Uh, maybe Suzuki. Or was that Omega? Oh, no, you know what? Ishii was biting it to fight a uh, a suplex. So maybe that was against Omega last year. Maybe yeah. That, that does sound familiar. Not to bring it up, but yeah, it was probably in that match. And again, it's totally, you know, it's sort of like the, uh, 
the water bottle in the eye as is like, you know, just asking to get MRSA. Like, could I please get staph infection? Yeah, but you know what? Evil's evil, so he he probably has some like built-in immunity to MRSA. <laughs> yeah, he's he's probably more evil than than most infections. So he, he is he is like... more evil than a staph infection. <laughs> so yeah, it cancels it out. Um, so yeah, there was a yeah, nice spot leading up to the finish. Sonata and Bushi both hit uh, planches to uh, Kanemaru and, and El Desperado. So you think that that's going to set up for you know Evil to get the victory, and he goes for the STO. But then um, Zack Sabre Jr. manages to counter that into a backslide, and then from there he transitions it into a rolling clutch pin for the win. And um, afterwards, Evil just looks furious. Like, he doesn't move. He's just, like, staring into the middle distance, just absolutely furious. I will, um, really uh, sold the defeat there. I will, I will pay money to see these two feud. Yeah, and they're they're totally setting up for it in the post match interviews too. Evils, or, you know, Sonatas are not evil. Sonata, Jesus. Um, Saber Junior's, you know, saying, "Oh, you know, Happy Halloween, dickhead! Like, why are we still feuding with these guys? Like, everybody's bored. Um, you know, just talking all this shit. Like, you're not really that evil. Like, you know, what? Like, it's it's, it's great. And then Evil is just pissed. You know, he's uh, yeah, he, he was he was really furious even after the match too. I love Zack Sabre Jr. It was actually when I when when uh, uh, Shantae and I first started dating and you know, I started talking about my res- wrestling fandom. Zack Sabre Jr. was one of the first wrestlers I told her about, and I'm like, dude, this guy's vegan. Yeah, and his he's got like I feel like he's the best promo out there. He's such a smarmy little prick, and I I fucking I eat it up. I love it. Yeah, he's he's a fucker. Yeah, he, he's he's perfect. Um, so yeah, that'll be fun watching those two go at it, and. Uh, you know, I, I can't wait to see Evil just, like, smash him in the throat with a chair and, you know, Evil to uh, eat a couple of nasty submission holds. It'll be uh, it'll be good fun. Oh, it's coming. It's coming. Mm-hmm. And apparently um, Evil also uh, threw out the challenge to Chris Jericho for the IC belt. So I think uh, Kevin Kelly kind of briefly mentioned that on commentary. So we can look forward to that as well. When do you think we're you think we're gonna get a uh, Jericho? <clears throat> we're gonna get a uh, Jericho um, Okada match at some point. I don't know. Probably not. I feel like Jericho is there to you know kind of put over people who aren't as established. So I'm hoping not. Uh, Jer- dude, Jericho beat Naito. Who's who's more established than Naito is? Omega. <laughs> Okay. But yeah, I mean, I can, I can, I can see your point. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I don't know. It's actually, it's actually hard to read Jericho's. I, I think Jericho's just wants to have fun and, and be like, like an evil old man. He's, he's like, yeah. he's, he's like the slightly younger American version of Suzuki. Yeah. But at the same time, he's still the dad at the frat party. Like all the cool people are in New Japan, so I'm gonna glom onto that and and you know leave. The WWE high and dry, which, you know, good for him. Somebody should do it. If anybody, you know, can do it, he, he should be the guy. But still, like, he's just – that's where all the heat comes from for me is, like, dude, you are just trying so hard to glom onto the cool shit. No, I – yeah. No, dude, I mean, I love Jericho. I've loved Jericho for, like, you know, 20-plus years now. But as I've said many occasions on this show, he's a tryhard. And then he's he's one of those guys that gets overly sensitive about criticism. Mm-hmm. And like he'll do some shit like he'll have like conspiracy theorists and flat earthers on her show on his show. And he's like he doesn't understand why people get annoyed by that. And I'm like, because dude, you're giving a platform to people that are objectively wrong. Yeah, I, I listened to one of those episodes just for poops and giggles and like the shit that they talked about was just beyond ridiculous. And yeah, 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 yeah. Don't get me on. Don't get me on a quote unquote freedom of expression rant. Right. Yeah. Uh, now is not the time or the place. It it, it is not. Um. So up next, uh, we've got a uh, another eight man tag match. We have got uh, uh, Juice Robinson, uh, Hanma, Makabe, Tanahashi taking on Jay White, Yoshihashi, Yano, and uh, Okada. Yeah, um, 
more uh, storyline development as far as the uh, the rift and chaos and the weird like pining over Yoshihashi. So um, that's the main story of this match. Um, there's an early exchange where um, Okada and Tanahashi start off the match and they're just kind of getting started, and then uh, Jay White blindly tags himself in without Okada's consent. So you know, again, just him you know being this heat magnet and just you know being a total prick. Um, and then later on, there's a spot where, um, you know, Okada's got Tanahashi in like, uh, a, a full Nelson on the floor waiting for Jay White to, to hit Tana and White just completely blows it off. Um, so again, just, you know, really bizarre actions by Jay White just being out for himself exclusively. And, you know, I don't know if he's intentionally trying to get under Okada's skin or if he's just doing it just to you know, just to fuck with whoever is there. And at this point it happens to be Okada, but either way he's, uh, you know, he's just being weird as hell. He's a fucker. That fucking Kiwi Trent Reznor. (laughs) I never, I never thought of that comparison, but that's, that's very apt. Yes. So, um, yeah, later on down the stretch of the match, we get, um, you know, some really good exchanges between Okada and Tanahashi, Okada hits a bitch in uh, shotgun drop kick. Um, you know, just uh, another really nice charging drop kick. Uh, you know, Tana's coming at Okada, and Okada hits that, that gorgeous drop kick on him as well. Um, you know, Tana comes back. He counters a Rainmaker with a twist and shout and a sling blade. And then um, he goes for a high fly flow after that, but so Okada gets out of the way. So, um, you know, nice little preview of the, the Kobe match, which happened earlier this morning. Um, really excited to watch that main event in light of uh, recent events. So this, uh, this ought to be a lot of fun. Recent events. Um, yes. Yeah. So juice juice goes over here. He hits the, uh, he hits the left hand of God and the pulp friction on, uh, it was on Yoshi, right? Yeah. Um, and a little bit before that, um, you know, uh, Yoshi Hashi has uh, juice Robinson on the, the full Nelson, and Jay White runs in and, you know, charges with Adam with a forearm, but just gets out of the way. So he ends up socking uh, Yoshihashi right in the chops leading up to that finish. And um, in the post-match afterwards, he's talking shit about, you know, sometimes you got to take, uh, you know, take one step back to get two steps forward, Yoshi. And that's pretty much the story of your whole career. So, <laughs> you know, just really laying it on thick. Um, yeah, and, you know, Juice, uh, Juice goes over looking good and, he uh, he does his best afterwards. He, he claims that uh, Yoshihashi's no ham and egg, and that was an important win for him. But uh, you know, we all know better. Yeah, the the pining over over Yoshi, like Tana wanting to like team up with him. It's just sort of like, dude, listen. <sighs> like I remember, I remember what it was like growing up, like talking about sports with people, and maybe there was like, uh, like so when I was a kid, like. Uh, everybody loved the Chicago Bulls, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, immediately, immediately after they loved the Detroit Pistons. But so you'd have like whatever player. So let's say, okay, so you'd actually, so everybody loved the Pistons and everybody started loving loving the Bulls because I got to be honest, people in Indiana don't know how to deal with pro sports. Um, so <laughs> you know it's true. Oh, I do. Yeah, that's why. That's why I was chuckling. Sorry. Oh, but yeah, you know what? You never fucking step foot in a college campus on your life, but you will fucking fight somebody on Indiana versus Purdue versus Notre Dame. I remember one of my one of my dad's fucking dipshit ass retarded sisters when I went to Purdue. And let's be clear, okay? So I am a graduate of Purdue University. I have a bachelor's degree in computer science. It is one of the achievements of my life, dude. That shit was fucking hard. It was it was so goddamn brutal. I was working two jobs at the same time so I could like live in like a decent place and not be stuck in a fucking dorm room dorm room with some ass backwards motherfucker. It's I actually had one room like one stranger of a roommate and that lasted until I woke up one night, him drunk off his ass, pissing in the uh, piss, pissing in the wastebasket. Well, that's fun. I literally moved out of that room the next day. Anyway, and so this dipshit, this dipshit sister of my father said, "Well, is your is your is your dad pissed off that you're going to Purdue because my my father is a fan of Indiana University basketball." 
What? So, <laughs> first of all, fuck Bobby Knight with a rhino's dick. Yeah, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> and it's like, well, if he's mad, tough fucking shit. Right. Number two, I am going to one of the legitimately best fucking science and engineering schools in the world. When like yeah. two generations ago, my grandmother was a fucking like bartender. And here I am at like this fucking peak universe. Oh, is he mad because he doesn't like he doesn't like their basketball coach? Whatever, dude. That's ridiculous. That's Indiana, right? So anyway, so you got all the, the kids like growing up. They'd be like, you know, they love the Bulls, so like they hate the Pistons, right? Because that was a big rival, and they'd be like, dude, Bill Lane beer sucks. Well, Bill Lane beer actually didn't suck. He was a fucking dirty player and an asshole, but he was like a hell of a basketball player. Right. So I hate to be that guy that I'm going to sit here and shit talk a guy that spent his whole life training to be a professional wrestler and he's actually probably like super talented. But dude, Yoshihashi fucking sucks. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, if, if you're mediocre anywhere else in the world, that'll get you by. But when you're mediocre in this new Japan climate, you're you're bottom of the barrel. I, I don't know, man. Yoshi Yoshi seems both unenthused and and not terribly charismatic. True, true. Yeah, and then afterwards, again, you know, we have that weird, uh, that weird pining over him. Um, Tanahashi goes over to try to like, you know, check on slash maybe console Yoshihashi, and like, everybody else, you know, from the Chaos Squad is just standing over him, like, "What the hell are you doing, dude?" And then um, Okada then you know tries to play nice and carry. Yoshihashi to the back, and Yoshihashi shoves him away and then leaves on his own volition. So, uh, yeah, lots of weird tension and weird pining after Yoshihashi. I'm thinking there has to be some, like, sex stuff going on in the background because this is way too weird for just, like, normal athletic stuff. Yeah. Somebody, somebody's fucking somebody. <laughs> and somebody is really jealous about it this is quite a love triangle yeah. yeah this is there's again this is this is not sports this is this is love or at a minimum lust true so moving on to the next match we'll, we'll talk about the exact opposite of lust here we've got uh hiroki goto taking on taiichi jesus fucking christ matt well jesus some lust fucking involved. christ <laughs> fucking fuck Fuck, fuck, <laughs> what the fuck is this fucking fuck? There was some lust involved here, though, because in the 30 seconds that Miho Abe was on camera, they uh, zoomed in really tight on her cleavage, like at least 10 of those seconds. She is on not. On like two or three different occasions. She is not unattractive. No, I, I, I agree. And she can, and God, she's with such a fucking jabroni. Why? Why is Taiichi a thing? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna channel channel the rock and how the rock used to talk to Kevin Kelly. Taiichi's never never tasted pie. <laughs> He's never eaten pie in his entire life. And they even paired him with a valet to make it appear as though that could be the case. But we all know better. I, you know, I don't want to talk about this other than to say, so Taichi has a singles title in New Japan. Um, Taichi fucking sucks. Um, you know what it is? It's like in, in, in um, Suzuki Goon, you've got Suzuki and Zack Sabre Jr. and Killer Elite Squad. And then Taka's kind of a legend. But then you have these like fucking sucky guys, right? And I guess you just have to balance out the awesomeness of like Suzuki and Sabre by having guys like Taichi and, you know, Kanemaru and Aizuka. Dude, I, it, yeah. I mean, and, and Kanemaru is like maybe the most decorated junior in the history of Noah, for whatever that's worth. But yeah, he's, you know, he's nowhere near on the level. That's like being the most decorated junior in the history of WWE. Like, what the fuck? Yeah, is, that, it's a yeah, fucking heavyweight true. territory. Right. Um, so, yeah, this, I mean, I think this match went like 20 or 25 minutes, too. 
And the first five or ten was all Taichi stalling on on the floor. I, I just, you know what, dude? I hope that this this results in either Goto getting the belt back, or Elgin getting run with the belt, or I don't know who's who's another guy like sort of on that on like a a, a never tier right now. Mm, I would say Makabe is probably on that level, um, just I, to name you know a veteran guy. I actually, you know what? It, actually, you know what? They should just have Makabe come out and just clobber the shit out of Taichi. Yeah. Um, even Yano. Oh my god, that would be so fun. Yeah. Yano could just like screw with him, hit him with like five nut shots in a row. Just like do like the most ridiculous sneaky style ever and just, you know. Like I, I just want to like, I think it was um, Def Jam Fight for New York. Method Man had a finisher where he legit just like kicked a dude in the ball sack like six or seven times in a row. I was actually the other night I was telling Shantae about Def Jam Vendetta. Yeah. Fight Free New York is probably better just because it's a sequel and, you know, it's more refined and everything, but both those games are sick. Well, you know, so you... I, I want, but I want Yano to do that to, uh, to Taichi. Just kick him in the balls like as many times as he can possibly get away with it. So I've got this Ben sitting in my game room. It's got like a bunch of random, it's like it's mostly my PS4 games, but then there's some other random shit in there too. That's actually where my my case for the uh, Zelda game for the the Switch has been hiding for months, where I thought it had been like lost, or one of the cleaners had thrown it out. Dude, I still got a copy of of uh, Def Jam for the GameCube in there, and I, then I'm like, and I kind of look over, and that's like, oh shit, I got a Wii over there, sitting under the TV, and I'm like, man, I might need to play this again. That's compatible. That's, that's cool. I didn't yeah, know. yeah. The 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 we if you there's there's a version of there's like a really like shitty fucking low rent big lots version of the Wii that doesn't play the GameCube games. But generally speaking, the Wii is is GameCube uh, backwards compatible. That's dope. Um, I don't I don't want to get on a rant, but I'll I'll talk to you off air about uh, the new PS One classic that's coming out. Oh, no, I, dude, no. You know what? We're actually going to run a little short today than we normally do. Get on a rant about that. I just, it looks dope. I don't know if you've seen anything for that. No, dude, it looks really cool. Um, I, I would like to know the full game list before they uh, they announce it. But uh, no, dude, it's a cool jam. I mean, they're, they're putting some fucking classic games on there. Um, you know, you're going to you're going to have you're going to have some modern connections. So, you, you know, because. God forbid you don't want to try to fucking plug a, a PS1 into a modern TV. Which I, I do that. I mean, <laughs> it sucks, but I, I've been doing it. Dude, um, I, don't, I don't even know that I have um, the right... Con- I don't even think I have the connections on my on my 4K TV that I can plug any of that shit in. Really? I guess I'm lucky then, just having a plain old HD TV then. Um, yeah, that, that looks awesome. Um, I would just play Tekken 3 for hours on end. Uh, if given the opportunity, so that's that's pretty that, that, that's, Yeah, no. I mean that almost compels me to just straight up go to like you know the exchange and and get a copy of Tekken Three, for, but that's uh, that's neither here nor there. I wonder if that's uh, I don't almost think that has to be like a P- PS One classic on the PS on the PS Four, but maybe not. It should be. I I can't imagine it not. No, but it's it's stuff. no, it's it's cool. It's a cool thing that they're doing. Um, actually, so the 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 switch online actually just uh came out this past week and uh it actually comes i think it's like so it's a monthly subscription where they have like a one of the things they have is a library of nes games and um so a couple things i realized um og tech mobile is way harder than i remember although i was starting to get my skills back by the end of my first game and the fucking the uh, D pad on the Switch Joy Con is goddamn garbage. Well, that's unfortunate. Yeah, I was like, I was sitting there trying to play Mario Three, and I'm like, like I'm, I'm sitting here in the office last night while Shantae's is is you know editing and doing voiceovers and stuff, and I'm just sitting there playing games, and I'm like, I dude, I cannot even fucking Mario on this. I mean, they're actually selling like Bluetooth uh, NES controller replicas. Like, I've got the Pro Controller for the Switch. It's fine, but if I'm actually playing the Switch handheld, forget about it. Yeah. 
it'd almost be worth it to go the uh, the retro route and get that NES controller. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like sixty for a pair of them, which isn't that bad. That's not bad at all. Yeah. No shit. Uh, so anyway, so fuck Taichi. He shouldn't have this title. They better fucking get it off off of him in like the next week or something. Yeah, he's even doing the Naito gimmick of tossing the belt around and acting like it's a piece of trash. And, like, he was just pissing me off even more in the backstage stuff. He's like, oh, the guy who didn't even make the G1 just won the big title. Like, who gives a shit, dude? It's not the big title. It's the never title. It's the first and probably only singles title you will ever win. Like, but, yeah, you know yeah, what? You know what? No, back the fuck off. You know what, Taichi? That fucking belt isn't the piece of trash. You, my friend, are the fucking piece of trash. Exactly. Okay, so let's move on to the main event because I'm just mad now, and I don't want to be mad on a I don't want to be mad on a Sunday afternoon. I want to eat tacos and fucking drink energy drinks and play <laughs> Diablo. That just reminded me. Have you watched any of Mark Maron's stand up? Uh, I was a big Mark Maron fan like back in the '90s. Um, so like I know his I kind of know his gimmick, but I haven't really like checked him out in a long time. Yeah, well, his. Uh... I think it's his most recent stand-up on Netflix. He's talking about how politically divided the country is. And, you know, if you're familiar with him, you know where he's going to stand on the stuff. But he's like, everybody, like, loves Tom Petty and burritos, right? And he's like, no. (laughs) Like, no, like, that's not enough. No amount of Petty is going to bring us together. (laughs) If I met the person that didn't like Tom Petty, or if I couldn't, like, say, well, maybe you're not into Tom Petty, but here, let me sell you with this. Man, I don't know. I don't know how I would bridge that gap. Yeah, that's uh, that's beyond me. But of course, I mean that is the common ground that we all share. And I can't imagine anybody not liking burritos either. Yeah, and it's even like um, I, can, I bet I could get Shantae to whip up like a, a like a mean fucking like like vegan burrito. Aziz, I don't know, man. She could do some crazy ass shit with some uh, with some tofu. That does sound good. Yeah, you whip up some tofu, man. You ever had like garden chicken before? I don't think so. It's basically, it's it's like a chicken made out of tofu. It just, it's, but it's like you wouldn't even, like we get, there's a restaurant we go to up in, up where she lives and we'll get like the Gardein wings and it's just, I don't know, man. It's a happy thing. That does sound dope. Okay, so let's talk about this main event. Yeah, dude. Um, Naito and Suzuki. Um They've really done a great job building up to this with the tag matches. Um, you know, Suzuki just beating the ever-loving hell out of Knights so every chance he got. And, you know, really wanted me personally to see Naito get his, uh, you know, get his. And, uh, yeah, it was just an awesome match. I mean, what I would say is that um, Naito is one of my favorite guys to watch sell because he's such a pro and he takes such a good ass beating. Um, it's interesting that he draws such good sympathy for his core being a heel. Um, what I will say about this match is that this is like, like really typical Suzuki good stuff with like Suzuki just murdering somebody. I felt like the finish to this kind of came out of nowhere and was a little flat and basically like their last big match when, when Naito won the IC title off of him. I totally dug the gotch power bomb though. That was pretty sick, yeah. Um, you know, there's lots of really good brutal spots in this match. Like early on, when uh, when Suzuki did the uh, the draping armbar slash triangle over the top rope, and then uh, yeah, just booted Naito off the apron straight into the guardrail. Like that was brutal as hell. You know, right from the get go, Naito is you know throwing, you know, uh, just putting the boots to Suzuki on the floor, and he spits on his face, and you know, just. You can tell that this is a grudge match right from right from jump, and it was just really awesome. The uh, the hanging sleeper off the apron again. Yeah, god damn, that looks brutal, dude. I don't know how they pull that off. Yeah, I, I that's don't, one of those. That's one of those spots where you're like, how how did they do that? I don't know how you. I mean, because you know, again, I mean, a sleeper. You're not necessarily cutting the air off. You're you're hitting the you're hitting the arteries on the side of the neck. I don't know how you stay awake through that with your full body weight pressing down on 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 your neck like that yeah just dangling like yeah that's it's fucking crazy um yeah you know a little brief hope spot um early on naito hits that uh combination cabron 
but you know Suzuki just goes right back to it. Um, you know, takes the timekeeper's table and just like legit cracks it over Naito's head. Like you can see the crack in the table after he smashes him in the head with it. Um, you know, then uh, Naito, you think you know just when you think Suzuki is gonna do like the the absolute ultimate in just brutality and, and do the gotch through the table off the apron. You know, Naito comes back and gets the gets the neck breaker off the apron through the table. Um, you know, that's uh, really the, the biggest turning point in the match, and it was just so awesome to to see Naito finally start to you know get some momentum in the match. I, uh, you know, this is, uh, Naito, Naito gets a big rally off of this and he hits the, uh, he hits the Gloria and then the flying forearm. I actually absolutely love Naito's flying forearm. Yeah, it looks great. Like he just, you know, propels his entire body at the guy and it, it yeah, it's, it's a great setup for the Destino. Um, but yeah, so they end up in the, uh, they end up in a, uh, cause after the 30 minute point, they start going into one of the, uh, the slap spots, just like really, uh, really nasty back and forth. Um, Naito ends up staggering Suzuki with that step up in Zaguri. Um, and that's when the, that's when the uh, Naito goes for the gotch. And um, I'm trying to ex- see if you can explain, because it turns into a power bomb. Can you kind of, I, I don't really have the words to explain what happened on that spot. It's almost, yeah, it's almost like, and I think this is how uh, Kevin Kelly explained it on commentary too, is it's almost like Suzuki just kind of threw his his weight out to try to get out of it. So Naito, instead of, you know, just letting him get away with it, he just, you know, thinks on the fly and adapts and and slams him into the mat. It almost looked like, um, you know, almost like a a Styles Clash type type of situation. Right. Um, except, except into a sit-out power bomb. So that that gets uh, Naito a two, and then uh, Naito follows that up with a Destino for the uh, three count. Yeah, and, and talking about Naito selling too. I mean, he was in uh, knee bar and uh, figure four and you know, ankle locks for damn near ten minutes. You know, it was it was well over five minutes of the match that he spent just on the mat writhing in pain. And even after the match, he can barely stand on his own two feet. So again, I, uh, um, I far from a bad match. I felt like it was a little flat. This is actually the second destruction, big show in a row that I thought lit like a, uh, and maybe it's just because we've all seen it before that I felt like it was uh, a little flat. Um, so we've actually got, uh, you know, one more destruction show, which was one that happened earlier today, and then a, in a week from now, and you know, and. Almost exactly a week from now, we have uh, we have uh, Fighting Spirit Unleashed in Long Beach, California. Yeah, um, like uh, like you had previously mentioned, you know that that's um, going to be a little bit late for us. Um, you know, we typically record on Sunday afternoons, so uh, you know Sunday evening would be a little bit late to uh, stay up and watch the show, especially since I have to wake up at six in the morning to get ready for work <laughs> yeah yes indeed well um <clears throat> so that's what we got coming up um the next couple of weeks we'll be you know like said, we'll be talking about uh, destruction in kobe the following week we'll be talking about fighting spirit unleashed and any uh, other interesting random shit that pops into our brains um maddie before we let these folks go is there anything you want to plug um other than my own stuff, which I'll get to in a second, um, check out the documentaries and stuff on, on New Japan World and New Japan's YouTube page. Uh, coming out with lots of uh, lots of really neat um, English uh, documentaries and, and little things that you know, kind of similar to WWE Network's uh, documentaries and stuff. But you know, Kevin Kelly uh, doing the majority of the of the. Uh, voiceover stuff on that really good stuff I, I, i'd recommend it well maybe maybe share a couple links on the uh, facebook page and the twitter let the folks know what you're talking about yeah will do absolutely and uh speaking of which um you know my my personal uh twitter is at albino buddha uh, typical spelling on each of those um underscore between the two um thompson mr90 is the instagram T H O M P S O N M R nine zero. Um, Facebook is um, Mad Matt T M A 
double D dot M A ha ha double T dot T. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that about covers it on my end. All right. Well, you can find the show on Facebook as Flying Gaijin Bombcast. You can find us on Twitter at FG Bombcast. The email is flying.gaijin.bombcast at gmail.com. You can find me on Twitter at the Zork that's spelled with a zero. Our theme song is played by my band, Northern Crown, where you can find it at northerncrownband.com. And while you're at it, go check out my girlfriend's uh, YouTube channel, naturalveganmama.com. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, and we will see you next week. I see the colors you don't see running down the wall. Infinity between spaces, unfamiliar sight.